Unfortunately, I'm not going to be talking about them, but uh, then we'll keep going all day. Good. So, good afternoon, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, I have to confess, I'm not a sound person, but it's very nice that uh, a lot of the, the sort of the details have already been covered by the, the previous speakers. So, so, so that's great. I can skip some parts of the introduction. Um, and before I say anything else, I would want to first acknowledge the efforts of Anastasia and Michele and their two master students who really did all the hard work, which I'm fortunate enough to, to, to get to present. Hopefully, I'll be able to do the work justice. And if you have difficult questions, Anastasia is here as well. So good. But yes, as you heard, it's all about echolocation. Um, and actually, this work is a continuation of uh, ongoing research about navigation in, vir in virtual environments using echolocation. And echolocation, as I'm sure you're all aware, is something that we normally asso associate with bats or toothed, toothed whales like dolphins, for example. Um, however, human beings can also echolocate. This is, I think, probably the most famous human echolocator in the world. His name is Daniel Kish. Um, and so even though he's blind, he can actually see the world using echolocation. And specifically, so he essentially does what other mammals do as well, that are echolocating. So he produces clicking sounds with his mouth. Um, and then by listening to the echoes that come back from these sounds, he gets an impression of the environment he's within. And Daniel here is actually so good that he can ride a bicycle without being able to see, which is very impressive. Uh, but it goes without saying, almost, that echolocation is an incredibly difficult skill to acquire as a human being. Uh, and it's very, very unlikely that individuals sort of that start training echolocation later in life would be able to reach this level of, of, of uh, proficiency. Nevertheless, having rudimentary echolocation skills as a blind person is likely to be beneficial. And we may even be able to start training people to give them echolocation skills if it's people that are getting blind later in life. As they're growing blind, we, it might be a good idea to start training already. Of course, this is somewhat speculative. Um, but that's essentially. At the heart of this work is this idea, can we use acoustic virtual environments to train people to echolocate? And this is sort of initial attempts at, at exploring these questions. And specifically, what we're interested in is um, trying to explore how different types of sounds affects novice users, so sighted users' ability to, to echolocate in, in virtual environments. Are they able to form cognitive mental maps, get a sense of the environment just based on echoes? And, and how does different types of sound affect their navigation performance. So I'm going to move straight to the, the system architecture and briefly explain that. So the hardware we used, we used an Oculus, CV, uh, Oculus Rift CV1 for, for visuals. I'll get back to when we were using visuals in a moment. We used a set of headphones. And as an input, we used a pair of Oculus controllers for one of the two studies we performed. I'm just going to be talking about the main study. Um, you'll have to, to, to look the, the, the pilot study up in the, in the paper. But the, the way we used the Oculus controllers was essentially that the forwards and backwards movement was instigated using buttons. Also, we didn't require the users to actually produce clicking sounds themselves, because creating good clicking sounds is actually surprisingly difficult. So instead, what we did was that they pressed a button, and then a, uh, a clicking sound was, was emitted in the virtual environment. So the way in which the, the environment was generated was using a combination of Unity and, and Steam Audio. So Steam Audio supports head-related transfer functions, but it also gives you quite a lot of options for manipulating the reflections, which we were hearing about earlier, uh, of sound waves in, in the environment. The way in which we uh, generated the mouth clicks, as I said, we didn't require the participants to generate them themselves, but based on information about, uh, or data on how experts actually sound when they're clicking, we developed uh, an, uh, the sounds in MATLAB, or an algorithm that can produce the sounds in MATLAB, and they were then played back, but it was a sample or a recording that was played back in the environment. These sounds were played back from the users, the virtual location of their mouth, basically. And we also had a, a body with an uh, audio shader associated with it um, to get appropriate re reflections there. Very briefly, the room acoustics to approximate or get good room acoustics, what we did was that we, um, we found the room impulsive re response of a similar environments, and then by playing back the sound in both environments, we were able to tweak the parameters of, uh, in Steam Audio to get somewhat similar results, or quite similar results. Um, and that brings me to the user study. So as I said, I'm going to focus exclusively on the, the main study today, 
the, the main lesson we learned from the, the pilot study was that we actually changed the input devices. In the original study, we used the keyboard. However, we realized that because uh, binaural hearing is so important for, for hearing spatial sound, it was very useful for the, the, the users to have decoupled their virtual movement and their head orientation, so they were actually able to explore the sonic environment better in that way. Um, good. So this brings me to the conditions. So as I said already, or hinted at, binaural hearing is necessarily important for spatial perception of sound. But as we heard in the, the previous talk as well, so are the reflections and reverberation of sounds. And they're important for echolocation as well. So what we compared in this study was uh, three auditory only conditions. So we had participants exposed to just reflections, late reverberations, and then the combination of the two while they were navigating using echolocation. And then we had a visual condition that was more or less just used as a baseline for comparison. So again, all of the participants were sighted. Uh, they could see. So, so this was essentially just to, to get a sense of, of the optimal conditions for them to, to navigate within this environment. Good. So for the procedures, the study took 40 to 60 minutes per participant for each of the 26 participants. It involved a rather lengthy training session. So, so what we did was that the participants were exposed to both uh, rever reverberations and reflections, but they were able to see the environment at the same time. So the idea is we encouraged them to navigate around the environment. It wasn't the same environment that was used for the study, but get a sense of how this, the, the, the sound changed when they were close to a wall, for example, uh, or when they were facing in, uh, no obstacles. Um, so they went through a, a rather long training session, and once they felt com comfortable, both using the, the hardware, but also had some, we had a sense that they, they knew how to interpret the sound, they were permitted to, to actually uh, start the study. And then we uh, exposed them to all four conditions. I should note that the visual condition, so they were counterbalanced, but the visual condition was always presented last, because we used the same environment for all conditions, and we did not want them to have, 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 have seen the environment before they started um, echolocating. So the task was very simple. They were inside this cave-like environment, and they were tasked with navigating through this corridor uh, segment. Uh, they started around the it's yellow on my screen, but I guess it's yellow up there. Um, the dot on the left, the, the, this, the exact position was randomized, and so was their orientation. Uh, but then they were tasked with finding uh, their way towards the, the green dot, and upon arriving at that spot, the, the trial would end. Um, yes. And as for the measures we used, uh, we used a combination of behavioral and self-reported measures. So behavioral measures, we had uh, observations, so looking at the users um, as they were navigating. We also collected quite a bit of data. So we collected data related to the virtual distance they, they walked or moved inside the virtual environment. We collected data related to completion time and how many times they trick, uh, clicked the button that made uh, them click inside the, the, the virtual environment. Good. Uh, and last but not least, we used questionnaires. And we used uh, specifically after each condition, they would be given a questionnaire with open-ended questions. So we got a lot of qualitative data related to their experience of the sound, but also their experience of, of navigating. And then finally, once they had tried all the conditions, we asked them to indicate which one they preferred. Which brings me to the results so, of the main study here. So one of the things, as I mentioned earlier, we were curious to, to, to explore was whether they were able to get a sense of the spatial layout of the environment. So whether they formed cognitive mental maps of, of the environment uh, or spatial maps. So what we did, very briefly put, was we looked for signs in the, in the, the, the qualitative data of them possessing landmark, landmark knowledge, root knowledge, and survey knowledge. Especially survey knowledge amounts more or less to you having a sense of the environment. Um, and then what we ended up doing was that we could see that some participants seemed to possess survey knowledge, others didn't. And based on that, we divided them into two groups. So, so specifically, we had one group that seemed to have formed these spatial cognitive maps. Another group, group N on the right, hadn't. And just a few characteristics about these groups. One group had 10 participants. Eight of these used VR regularly, or more or less worked with it. Six, six of them were sound engineers. We also noticed that the two groups before used slightly different strategies. Um, many of the, the ones in the CM group uh, would constantly click while moving around the environments, while others would simply stand still, click a lot, and turn their head in, in order to, to explore the, the acoustic environment around them. 
For Group N, we had 16 participants, so eight of, eight of them had some VR experience, nine, nine had a background in IT, and a, and a frequently observed strategy there was that they would move up to a wall. Once they realized there was a wall, they would start following that one until they at some point uh, reached the, the exit. And we also uh, used these categorizations in the analysis of the data. So we first we did a cross comparison across all conditions or across all participants, so all 26. We also ran separate analysis, analyses for the two groups. And finally, we compared the two groups with each other. And I'll, I'll briefly run through that, those results. So first, looking at the results for all participants. So this is the behavioral, behavioral data. You see distance walked on the left, completion time in the middle, and number of clicks on the right. And that's how the configuration of figures is going to stay for the next couple of minutes. But there's absolutely no surprises here. What we found was that when they could see, they were significantly uh, they, they walked shorter and they were faster, right? And we didn't, but we didn't find any differences here between how much they clicked. Um, we saw some, something fairly similar when looking at the group that did not seem to have formed these cognitive maps. Again, the visual condition outperformed the, the purely auditory ones. So no surprises there. It is worth noting that, that there were some differences in terms of, of how much this group uh, clicked across conditions. Good. So moving on to the group that seemed to have formed uh, cognitive maps. Again, we see the same pattern. Not surprisingly, they perform best with the visuals. But for this specific group, the significant difference between the condition, so the green one, which is reflections and reverberation, and the visual condition disappears. Of course, that doesn't mean they're equivalent. But it does illustrate that, it, that in this case, they, they performed reasonably well with this specific um, uh, feedback. And when comparing the two groups, uh, what we looked at was just we performed nine pairwise comparisons. What we did find was that when they were exposed to both reverb and, rever uh, and reflections, then the, gr the groups that had formed these cognitive mental maps, they walked shorter and they also clicked less than the other group. And then last but not least, the preference rating, there was a clear preference across all participants for the combinations of reflections and reverberations. So just to quickly sum summarize uh, the findings, as expected, the visual stimuli led to uh, superior performance. The group that seemed to have formed these cognitive maps, in, in those, that case, we got similar, of course not identical performance in terms of the, uh, the RR condition and the V condition. In terms of group N, one of the things we noticed was that they seemed to click more than the other group, and that could simply be that they got less out of the, the sound, less information out of it, so they felt the need to click more. This is necessarily somewhat speculative. Um, then we identified some navigation strategies, which I briefly touched upon earlier. And then, sort of on a broader point, uh, we found that novice users were able to safely navigate using echolocation in this very, very simple scenario. And again, they weren't given much training. So I think all in all, we think that using acoustic virtual environments might have some potential for, for these sorts of training purposes. And on that note as well, we found that this audiovisual training procedure seemed to be quite effective. But of course, we haven't compared it within auditory only, only training procedure, uh, but at least it does seem to offer some promise. So that was what I had to say. If you're interested in, in this topic, echolocation more broadly, then Anastasia and a couple of our students also have a demo and a poster here where they're talking about visualizing echoes. Uh, so if, if you're interested in that, I'd encourage you to check that out. Thanks. Hi. Um, first, very interesting. I liked um, one question. I'm, if I'm, if I remember correctly, then headphones and audio drivers usually don't handle the very edges of the human hearing spectrum. Is there? Do you have any intuition about, like, what what it could, how much it could help if we could like handle a very 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 high sounds that we maybe even don't uh, consciously um, hear, but we pro would process for something like echolocation. How that mm. might help. Is there anything like that? I'm embarrassed to say I wouldn't have any idea. As I said, I'm not a really a okay. proper sound guy, so I'm not sure, but it's, it's a good point. Indeed. So, so maybe it would be interesting to, um, to check um, whether, like, how effective that is compared to a completely uh, physical training to, yeah. to see if, the, if the, the simulation is good enough. Maybe. Yeah, so, so, so essentially doing acoustic replica of a, a real training scenario and comparing the two mm. things. Or, yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. Yeah, point indeed. Thanks. Uh, very nice work. So one question, you showed the results and showed RR was very close to V. Yeah. 
Watch your environments, indoor and outdoor, because if I have to conjecture, you know, in indoor environments, reverberation plays a bigger role. With outdoor yeah. scenes, you don't see, so even the people who do echolocation. It, it was an indoor environment, indoor. but like a fairly, like a cave-like corridor. Right, okay. okay. Yeah. So if you had an outdoor scene, like walking on the streets. Yeah, you would, you imagine it would shift, or we would I, see. My, my conjecture is our, the dynamic reverberation doesn't play equally strong role as inside of a cave, you yeah. know. So I'm, I'm guessing would you, what would you just say results might be in that condition. But, but well, as you say, if you, if you suspect that wouldn't have an influence, then we would well, I, want to, I want to see what you observe. Then, then it would be probably be, we would get similar results as, as for the other two conditions, I, I would imagine. Yeah. But it's a good point in the sense that, that in order for this to be used for, for actual training, a cave is probably not the environment to, 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 to be using. You would have to use both outdoor and sort of naturalistic settings that a, that a person would be likely to, to encounter. So yeah, okay. thanks. But again, great work. Thank you. Not 